fade out. So that's James Taylor's smiling face. Um, I did a recording of it just before this one that was really right there in the pocket and right at the very end, the phone, which I thought was off, rang. So it took me a few minutes to yell at it. I got a sore throat now from screaming at the phone. I was pissed off. Um, but um, I love that song. It was always a fun song to play. It was from the JT album. And I wrote down all the credits from that album because it's a remarkable album. And I just thought I would give a shout out to everybody on this. Um, obviously, James Taylor. Um, we cut it at the Sound Factory in Hollywood. And Peter Asher produced it. Val Garay was the engineer. Val did a lot of James stuff. Val's a monstrous engineer. But the musicians are Cooch, you know, who I am still playing with in the immediate family after all these years and enjoying it more than ever. Dan Dugmore playing guitar, myself. Russ Kunkel playing drums. David Sanborn played sax on it. Clarence McDonald, Dr. Clarence McDonald keyboards. Man, Mac D is one badass. I love Mac D. And it's funny, Red Calendar played tuba on this record, on one of the tracks. But when I was just starting out on string bass, one of the guys I listened to a lot, who was a great bass player, is Red Calendar. So it was kind of a, you know, full circle with that. Uh, David Campbell did the string arrangements on it. I've been with David since uh, Jackson Brown's first record. You know, he's a great arranger and stuff. And not a bad group of background singers. We had Linda Ronstadt, Carly Simon, and Leah Kunkel. So that is my notes for today <clears throat> on that. But it's really um, one of those songs that just everybody always goes, oh, I love that bass part. Now, my issue is I hope nobody's going and listening to original tracks and coming back going, what's well, not what you played on the original? Um, like Lyle Lovett said once, he never played the same thing once. So, you know, I'm I'm not that kind of player. I, I, I kind of play off the seat of my pants whenever, um, by the way, Frankenstein. Um, whenever um, I'm playing, I just, I'll play it different every single time, especially when it comes to like the little licks and stuff at the end. I'm trying to remember what I played, but, you know, it, it would be different every time. Uh, one of the, the worst things I ever experience as a studio player is if I'm doing a project and they uh, say, oh man, I, I love what you played. Could you double it? Panic <laughs> sets in at that point because I have no idea what I played. Then I end up sitting there having to go bar by bar half the time figuring out what it was unless they tell me in advance they want to double it then I'll consciously do a part that I can remember pretty easily. Um, or you come back the next day and they say, uh, we're going to cut it again today and do exactly what you did yesterday. And I'm, man, I'm a deer in the headlights at that point because I really fly by the seat of my pants when I play. I'm not analytical in my parts. I just, I kind of close my eyes and just respond so like just on this performance here, I know that's not what I played exactly on it. It's, it's I'm going more for the feel on it. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things. I, I've had people write in talking about injuries like tinnitus and things like that. Uh, you know, just um, any hand injuries. And that, um, I think every player I know practically suffers from some little bit of tinnitus. So that's, that is no fun at all. Um, having that little bit of ringing in your ears. Some guys I know have it really bad where it's it's almost louder than uh, than their normal hearing. And it's really difficult to deal with. Carpal tunnel, people have been, you know, asking me about that, what exercises. Um, one of the reasons I'm really not a, a slapper is I've had a lot of hand injuries, wrist injuries over the year. And this position just does not feel comfortable to me. I don't have control or dexterity on it. And my left hand, these two fingers, um, I've, I've had like ligament problems and stuff. Almost 90% of my playing is these two fingers. I, 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 and, and a lot of my parts have been created because of a physical limitation uh, fit, you know, in, in my playing because of 
my dexterity when I watch some videos and I, I see people that are doing there's part of the problem is I came from an upright world and the this finger <laughs> this finger uh, really does not get used until you're at the octave point and then when you're up here but when you're down here When you're down there, it's a different fingering. Um, so I, I'm kind of a, a, an amalgamation of classical training and injuries all kind of mushed into, into a style. A lot of uh, what I do, uh, I, I do a lot of glissandos and you know, a lot of, you know, just playing in. I throw in, in glisses and a lot of that's because my physical ability to make it to that point isn't necessarily as as good as my ability just to do that. Uh -huh. I remember on um, working on the TV shows that I used to do with Mike Post. Um, he'd always go, "Man, you're like the king of glisses," and and for me it became a signature um, out of necessity. So um, it's something I have to work at all the time. You know, I'm feeling my chops way down since this whole. Um, quarantine began because even when you're sitting here playing and I'm you know I try to play pretty regularly it's not the same as being with other cats and digging in and really nailing it so I'm feeling it in my hands a bit I feel fortunate uh, for the fact that I'll be 73 in a month and I still do have dexterity um, that I haven't had to deal with arthritis or anything uh, of that nature but um, but it seems like every time I've ever had an injury it's my hands. It's not my feet. It's not my knees. It's not my hips or anything. And um, I was doing tree trimming a few years back with a with a big lopper, and it slipped and fell. And this finger, <laughs> back to my fingers, it sliced it right in here, all the way down to the bone. I mean, I could spread the skin and see the bone. And the next day, I had a huge movie date at Capitol that I could not miss. So I went to the uh, emergency room and they stitched everything up. And I had, I mean, it, it, the guy said, my hand was stitched up into this position. I had tape all over and they had a metal splint. And then he said, is that okay? I said, that's good with me. That's really great. But I got to Capitol and I thought, man, I can't go in there looking like this. So I sat in the parking lot and took all the dressings off and kind of just kind of masked the, all the stitches and everything. And went in and did like a six hour movie call. When, you know, when it was over, I went back out to the car and put everything back on it. And after that, I had, you know, like a week where I really wasn't going to be pushing it. So I was there, but never missed a gig because of injuries. I've played through a lot of injuries uh, in, in the past and illnesses. There's nothing worse than being sick on the road and having to play a show. And you can't remember because you're delirious from a, a fever whether or not you played the bridge yet or not, <laughs> it's uh, you go through a lot. Go, go through a lot of stuff doing this. It's it's not just whipping out your your instrument and 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 playing the tune. Uh, been on the road with, with guys. We did one tour with and Waddy Wachtel. I think he stepped on a, one of the big cable snakes and and twisted his ankle and was on crutches and had to sit in a chair for the remainder of the tour. And Wadi sitting in a chair is is it's just it's unconscionable. I mean, Wadi is a, a whirling dervish Tasmanian devil on stage. He likes to be moving and to see this poor cat stuck on a chair really sucked. But you know there's nothing he could do about it. Um, he was he could not stand on that. In the same way with Phil Collins on this on the last tour we did. I mean we were out for quite a while, but. He's developed because of bad surgeries um, to his back and, um, and stuff. Uh, he just can't stand for a long period of time at all. So he chose to do the tour sitting on a stool. And um, at first, I think there was a lot of question as to whether people would accept this because Phil was another one of those guys that was just like covering the stage, man. He was going at it all the time and run up and play his drums and all that. Um, and he couldn't do that anymore. But I think people wanted to hear the songs and they wanted to see Phil. And the fact that we had his son Nicholas back there on drums, it's kind of like, you know, Phil passed the baton to the next generation. And he, and he did an unbelievably great job. So 
Um, God, this is a long conversation starting from your smiling face, but um, uh, so I just wanted to play that one. I hope I hope it's an adequate performance. Uh, it's once again, none of this feels 100% right to me because I'm not in circumstances that I'm used to playing in, and so I'm playing in a slightly different way. But um, I'm gonna, I might. Maybe I'll come tell a story, but I might take the weekend off and just do, I've got some serious work around the house that I want to take care of. I might just chill out for the weekend because it's gotten pretty hot here. Um, I just drove by a, a bank and I don't know if their thermometer, digital thermometer was right, but it said 104 and it sure feels like it though. So everybody take good care. Um, Again, I appreciate so much all the comments I've been I've been getting uh, on on these videos. It's it's really it's really touching to me that people are coming and seeing these things and, and appreciating them. Uh, I've had a couple of pant loads come in and say crap, but you know whatever. That's the world we live in, and I'm not I'm not losing sleep over it. Um, I got enough other stuff that I always lose sleep over, but. Um, Please take good care of yourselves out there. Take good care of your family and your friends. Um, and uh, again, take a moment and just in your heart, thank all the uh, people that are taking care of things, all the multitude of first responders that are working so hard every day. I was just at, at two markets this morning at the pet food store, and I'm looking, all these people are in there all garbed up and just working. And I go, thank you. I say thank you every time to all of them. Say so you're so appreciated. And um, and that's that. So um, I may see you this weekend. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens here. Definitely be back Monday. I have a couple other tunes with some really good stories about them. And um, oh, I was going to say, God damn it, I'm glad I caught myself. On the original track of Smiling Face, Yamaha came to Los Angeles back around 1970 or 71 with a, about a half a dozen uh, one-off basses and they got different bass players to come in and gave us each one to work with and they wanted an, you know an evaluation of, of these. I remember Abe Sr. was in, he got a bass and, and I got one and the one that I got was this kind of cherry red um, looked it was very much a knockoff of a Fender Precision. Uh, pickups were the same, neck was the same kind of contour and everything. Headstock was really ugly, and the tuning machines looked like something from Ben-Hur that would be on a chariot to rip flesh. And uh, and I told him, I said, thing sounds great. I said, it's just, it's a little, the headstock was a little bit funky and, and stuff. Um, but I use that on a lot of a lot of stuff. I use that on a bunch of live section um, gigs, uh, and used it on on the JT album on Smiling Face. I ended up selling it uh, a, a number of years ago. Uh, I'm not a collector, and um, I've got a mountain. Maybe I'll give a hustle right now. I've got a mountain of gear uh, that I've got for sale with a company called Techno Empire. You can look them up. But I, I had a warehouse like full of stuff that just gets accumulated over the decades. And I just thought this stuff needs to be played. It does not need to be sit in mothballs. And so I contacted these guys and, um, and it's great. Um, they've been selling um, all kinds of stuff. I sold my Billy Thorpe giant clip system, which was the first time we played a gig, the uh, the crew thought that was the PA system and set it at the front of the stage. I said, no, that's backline. And, uh, and somebody bought it. You know, maybe they were doing a retaining wall. I don't I don't know. But um, if anybody's looking for any stuff, it's it's there. And I'm t uh, as always, I'm taking a chunk of my dough. There's a place called the Elephant Sanctuary in Tennessee. And that's one of my real pets. Uh, I, I like to donate to them. And I'll probably do the same when I do my finger book. Uh, that'll be one of the charities that I'll that I'll give to. But it's the Elephant Sanctuary in Tennessee. Amazing people, it's fabulous. So, have a great w weekend. If I don't see you, and um, if I do see you, I see you. Bye.